Hey everyone, we are going to do our third video for chapter six. So in this video, we're going to look at putting those mechanism steps together and then looking at um, some specifics to go along with those mechanism patterns. So in the section we're looking at, it's explaining that in most reactions, we don't just need one of those mechanism patterns, we actually need multiple mechanism patterns. So in this reaction up here, we're starting with a proton transfer. So our oxygen is getting protonated by our acid here. So notice we have the, the two arrows. So our our first arrow here is the bond forming between the oxygen and the hydrogen. And then the second arrow right here is the bond of breaking between the hydrogen and the bromine. And so with our proton transfers, we normally need two arrows because we are transferring that proton or that hydrogen. So it has to break the bond from its old atom it's bonded to and form the bond to the new atom. The second step is the loss of a leaving group. And we can see that right here. So loss of a leaving group requires one arrow. There might be other arrows to show electron flow, but this one only needs that one arrow. So this arrow is showing the bond breaking between that carbon and the oxygen. And as a result, we end up with a carbocation. The negative H2O here is telling us that the water was our leaving group. So this isn't telling us that we are uh, it's telling us essentially with the result of the reaction. So it's saying that we've lost water because of this reaction. Now we have a carbocation here. So in this step, we have to look for carbocation rearrangements. This is a secondary carbocation. So right here, this guy is secondary because it's bonded to one, two carbons. And so we look at its neighbors. So over here, there's three hydrogens. If we were to shift one of those hydrogens over, we would end up with a primary carbocation at this location, at this end methyl group location. If we shift over one of these methyl groups from the other neighbor carbon, then we will end up with a tertiary carbocation. And the reason why we're not looking at shifting a hydrogen over from, from this carbon is because there aren't any. So when we shift over, when we shift over our, our methyl group from, from this neighbor, we draw the arrow from that bond because we're starting at the electrons and we're going towards that carbocation. So right here, this is our methyl that has shifted over. And as a result, our carbocation is now in that new location. And we now have that tertiary carbocation. So we went from being secondary to tertiary, which is what our carbocation or shift needs or our rearrangement needs. It has to become more stable. And then in that last step of this reaction, we are doing a nucleophilic attack. So bromine is our nucleophile here, lone pairs, negative charge, electronegative, and it fits into more than one category. Our arrow starts at the lone pair of that bromine and ends at that carbocation. So it's showing us that new bond forming between the carbon and the bromine. Now in this in this example up here, we're using all four of our mechanism types, which is why it's used as an example. It's not very common to have all four types in the same reaction. The other thing about this one is that we're doing one mechanism type at a time. Down here, we're showing a nucleophilic attack and the loss of a leaving group, and they're occurring at the exact same time. So this is just to point out that we can have more than one mechanism step happening at once, or they can happen 
um, one at a time in a reaction. This is something we'll talk about as we learn specific reactions. All right, here's a bigger reaction. Our question says, label each arrow with the mechanism pattern that is shown. So we're looking at how the arrows are drawn and what's happening. Um, in this first step, we are we have an arrow from the oxygen to the hydrogen, so we're forming a new bond to a hydrogen. So that gives us a proton transfer. Step number two, we're going from this oxygen to the carbon. This second arrow right here is just showing resonance or that flow of electrons. So this isn't technically part of our mechanism patterns. But as we go from that oxygen to that carbon, this falls under the nucleophilic attack category. The oxygens are nucleophile. In the next step, we have A here. So if we go back and look, we have HA. HA is often just used as a generic acid, just like it was in general chemistry. So this is our conjugate base of that acid. But what's important here is what our arrows are doing. So again, we're involving that hydrogen, which tells us that we're going through a proton transfer. And we're going through a proton transfer, and in this case, it was a deprotonation. So we're removing a hydrogen from this oxygen. We're going to do one more proton transfer. So here's our oxygen, and we're forming a bond to our hydrogen there. So again, proton transfer. And then let's look at this step down here. So we have two arrows, one going from that lone pair to right here. So that's telling us that a new double bond is going to form. And then another arrow going from the bond onto that oxygen. So this bond is showing that we have a leaving group. The bond is breaking and the electrons are going onto that oxygen as a lone pair. The second arrow down here is just showing that flow of electrons. So there's our water as our leaving group, loss of leaving group. Next step, we're going from the lone pair to that carbon. So this is very similar to our step that was up here. So again, we have a nucleophilic attack. And then in our last step, we have, again, our conjugate base. And as it forms that bond to that hydrogen, we are doing another proton transfer. So again, this is a deprotonation step. And then we get our final product there. Uh, this section is talking about some guidelines on drawing curved arrows. And most of these we've talked about. We know that the tail of the arrow has to be on a bond or a lone pair. It has to start at the electron source. And then the head of the arrow, so the pointed part of the arrow, is going to show the formation of a new bond or of a lone pair. So as we go from that lone pair onto that carbon, that's showing a new bond forming between the oxygen and the carbon. And then here we're going from the bond onto the atom, and so this is showing a bond breaking and turning into a new lone pair. And then always important to remember that our carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen can't have expanded octets. So sometimes those extra arrows are needed to show the flow of electrons to prevent that. I'm sorry, I thought I would be able to do this. Let's do it this way instead. There we go. So we're going to have an arrow going from our bond to our bromine. So that's showing the bond between the carbon and the bromine. But then our bond between the bromines needs to break. And we know that that's going to happen because they're not bonded together anymore. And we end up with this negatively charged bromine over here. So as, as this bond right here breaks, those electrons are turning into a lone pair. Uh, that one might be the hardest one on here. I think I put the hardest one on the top. So if we look at the second one here, we have a carbocation, and we have a negatively charged nitrogen. So we have a good nucleophile and a good electrophile. And then we can see over here that we have formed a bond between that nitrogen and that carbon. So I'm going to go, I'm going to draw in my lone pair here. 
I'm going to go from the lone pair to that carbon. So this falls under our nucleophilic attack category. In our next one, we have a secondary carbocation, and then over in the product side, we have a tertiary carbocation. And because that's the only thing present, that tells us that we had to have had a carbocation shift. So I'm going to fill in my hydrogen right here. Because in order for this to occur, we had to have had a hydride shift. I'm going to bring back cursive today. So I'm going to go from this bond to that carbocation. And so I'm going to draw my hydrogen in right here just to show where it went. Um, but this would be our hydride shift. All right, the next one, we have an oxygen. We have a hydrogen. And then we can see over here that our oxygen and our hydrogen are now bonded together. So again, I'm going to draw in my lone pairs on that oxygen, and I'm going to go from that oxygen right onto that hydrogen, and that's showing that bond forming between that oxygen and that hydrogen. And then in our last one, oh, this was a proton transfer. Let's give it a name here. In our last example, or last problem here, we have a bond between a carbon and a bromine, and then over here we end up with that carbocation, and we end up with a bromide. So because my bromine is no longer bonded, I know that it needs to break away from the rest of the molecule, and because it's negatively charged, I know it's taking those electrons with it. So I'm going to go from the bond right onto that bromine, and I know that this is a loss of a leaving group. All right, we're going to look at a couple more. There we go. So in this one, we're going to fill in the missing products based off of these curved arrows. So in that first problem, we have an iodine going towards that carbon, and then our arrow showing that bromine, the electrons going onto that bromine. So I know that there's two things happening here. Um, in the iodine arrow, I know that this is a nucleophilic attack because my iodine is my nucleophile and it's forming a bond to that partial positive carbon. The second arrow to the bromine is going to be my leaving group arrow because my electrons are going onto that bromine and it's showing that bond breaking. So we end up with this as our product so there's my bromine as my leaving group, and my iodine is now bonded to that carbon. In the second one, I'm going to put my lone pairs on my oxygen there. Our arrow is going from the oxygen to that carbon. So again, this falls under our nucleophilic attack category. Our oxygen is a nucleophile because of its lone pair. Our carbon is an electrophile because of its positive charge. So when we draw out our final product, we end up with this. Now our oxygen has a positive charge on it because it still has those two hydrogens bonded to it. And because it has those two hydrogens, it will be positively charged. All right, last one, we have a cyano down here. So we have a carbon with a negative charge and our arrow is going towards our partially positive carbon and then our second arrow is going from our pi bond up to that oxygen. So our cyano group is going to be a good nucleophile because of its negative charge. So this is a nucleophilic attack. And then our second arrow is, again, just that flow of electrons. Um, we know that one of our resonance patterns was a pi bond between two different electronegative atoms. So that's why it fits in here. So there we go. Our oxygen is negatively charged because it gained those extra electrons. And remember, the charge has to stay the same. So over here, there was over on the uh, left side, 
right here we had one negative charge so we still have one negative charge over here we had one positive over here we still have a positive over here we had a negative and we still have a negative so keep that in mind as you're drawing these structures to keep your charges balanced all right one more or one more page uh, so in our first example there are we have two arrows we're going from the oxygen towards the bond and then from the bond towards the chlorine so this is our leaving group so we have the loss of the leaving group the arrow going from the oxygen is just part of that flow of electrons so this is very similar to the last one on the previous slide just essentially the reverse um, this one's a little bit trickier we have two arrows we have an arrow going from our pi bond our nucleophile towards that hydrogen and then we have an arrow going from the electrons towards the other carbon so this is going to be a proton transfer it's not as obvious as the other ones we've seen but the movement of that hydrogen is what's causing our structure I think I might have written over where my structure will be oh, a little bit um, so the pi bond electrons were used right here and then the electrons between that boron and hydrogen are now used between that boron and carbon that one was definitely a, a more difficult one all right last one on this page we have an arrow going from the electrons of our carbon hydrogen bond towards that primary carbocation so we end up, instead of having a CH2, we have a CH3 because we went through a hydride shift. And now we have, there we go. Now we have a tertiary carbocation. All right, in our, our next section, we're looking at whether or not carbocation shifts will occur. Anytime we have a carbocation, we have to think about whether or not they can occur. And the way we decide is really a, a couple steps. The first thing we wanna do is we wanna decide what type of carbocation we have. So in our question here, can a shift make these carbocations more stable? So if we look at our, our first one in part A, we have a secondary carbocation. And I know this because we're bonded to two carbons. And so to decide, so that's our first step. Step number one is to decide what type of carbocation you already have. Step number two is to look at the neighbors. And we want to look for hydrogens and methyl groups on the neighbors. And step number three is, well, if we move a hydrogen over or a methyl over, will it make it more stable so does it increase the stability these are only going to occur if that stability increases and a hydrogen shift will always happen before methyl so if there is a hydrogen available that's going to be the one that shifts over so if we look at this first prop this first structure here we do have a hydrogen available on the carbon on the left and on the carbon on the right we only have methyls available so if, if this hydrogen were to shift over, our carbocation would be right here, which would still be secondary. So that's not gonna happen. So instead, if this methyl group shifts over, this would be our new carbocation and it would be tertiary. So that will happen. So to answer the question, this one will go through a methyl shift. In part B, we have a primary carbocation. So when we look at the neighbors, there aren't any to the left. When we look at this carbon, it does have a hydrogen on it. And so if we shift this hydrogen over, our carbocation will then be right here, and it will be a tertiary carbocation. And so it will become more stable. So this one's going to go through a hydride shift. 
in letter C, we have a secondary carbocation. So we look at the neighbors. Um, they each have a hydrogen attached to them. So we could do a hydride shift, potentially do a hydride shift from either location. If it goes to the one on the right, let me get another color here. If it goes over here, it would be tertiary. And if it goes over here, it would be tertiary. But there's one extra thing to consider. On the left over here, this position right here is called a benzylic position. And if we have a carbocation in a benzylic position, it's extra stable because it's going to have the resonance with the ring to help stabilize it. So benzylic carbocations are extra stable. And so that would make it tertiary benzylic. So this one is going to go through a hydride shift towards that benzene ring. And then in our last one down here in letter D, we have a tertiary carbocation, and more specifically, because it's on a carbon next to that double bond, it's a tertiary allylic carbocation, so it does have resonance. So when we look at its neighbors, we have a carbon down here, so if we did a hydride shift, that would make it secondary, so that's becoming worse. We have a carbon over here with a hydrogen, multiple hydrogens. If we did a shift over there, it would become primary. So again, that would make it worse. And we do have a hydrogen up here, but having a vanillic carbocation is one of the worst options. So we are not going to do a shift on this one. So no shift for this one because it's already very stable. Oh, I did have them labeled. <laughs> That's the official labels. Here is our, our extra pictures to explain that allylic and benzylic stability. So here's our allylic carbocation. It has one extra resonance contributor. So we know resonance helps make things more stable. And then when we have that benzylic carbocation, so a carbon attached to a benzene ring, we have five total resonance contributors. So that's going to make it very, very stable. All right. Last topic is whether or not these mechanism steps are reversible or not. So really, should we be drawing them with equilibrium arrows or regular arrows? And we can make some generalizations based off of the mechanism type. When we're looking at a nucleophilic attack, we can use the reversible arrows if our nucleophile can also be a good leaving group. A nucleophilic attack and loss of a leaving group are opposite types of reactions. A leaving group is almost always reversible because leaving groups also tend to be good nucleophiles. And in the proton transfer category, we can use our reversible arrows if the pKa difference is less than 10. If the pKa difference is greater than 10, then we would use the regular arrow. And then the last one, here is our carbocation rearrangements, and these are usually not reversible, so we just draw a regular reaction arrow. And then the last one down here is other considerations. So this is um, looking at a nitrogen group as a leaving group, and we're drawing it with just that regular reaction arrow, and it says Le Chatelier here. So the reason for that regular arrow is because we just need N2. And we know that N2 is a gas, so it's just going to bubble away in our reaction. And Le Chatelier's principle tells us is that if we remove a product, our reaction is going to shift towards the product side. So this is not going to be going back and forth between reactants and products.
Now, I went through that last few slides kind of fast, and the reason for that is I do not make a big deal about what types of arrows we draw. When we start looking at mechanisms for specific reactions, I almost always draw my, my reaction arrows as just regular arrows because we are looking at a reaction going in a specific direction. We're looking at it going in the forward direction. Even though it's possible to go backwards, that's not the direction that we are focusing on. So not a big component of of this chapter. All right, that is our last slide here. The video ended up being a little longer than I um, anticipated. I think just because I had a few more practice problems in there. Um, but this is it. So this is the end of chapter six. Thank you very much.